ending stocks reported by the USDA report and the Chinese economic slowdown and its impact on commodities. Max Zuzlo is ready to comment on that right here on Connected Farmer, your channel to keep you up to date with the latest trends in agriculture and livestock. So, Mike, I hope you are doing well today. Uh, the report came out with uh, uh, higher ending stocks for corn and soybeans. Uh, what's your assessment of, for the market impact? Well, the, the fundamentals, I think, partially are being um, moved around in the trades mindset, but the trading activity is still the same as before the report, Louise. And what I mean by that is the row crops, the soybeans, especially new crop, and even the August contracts continue to gain on the corn, even though we saw a, a small increase in total usage for 23, 24 corn, and we did see that yield reduction. Um, the, the ending stocks came in right with the trade estimates for corn. However, because USDA did not change the bean yield for 23-24, and they took the total usage down 135 million bushels, um, the estimates were well off. Uh, the 200 million bushel expectation was off by 50 million bushels, um, or three, excuse me, 100 million bushels, and I'm sitting at 256 uh, for my estimates. And so I, I think that the if you looked at the trade, reaction to the uh, report numbers, you would have expected the trade to sell out of their beans and buy back their corn, given the U.S. supply demand, but we're not doing that. And so I think there's more in this market other than just the USDA report. Now, having said that, the wheat market, it's playing fairly closely, I think, to the report. The, the yield increase of 1.2, I think it was, bushels to the acre, taking us up close to last year's above 46 bushel to the acre in all wheat. That gave us an increase in carryover numbers domestically. Um, that seems to be still working its way through the market. It, it did after the report. It's still doing it on Thursday. That Even though we've got a fresh 2023 low in the U.S. dollar index today as we go on the air, um, this weekly move down in the dollar index is the greatest since November of last year. And to go back and give you an idea of how big of a move this is on a weekly basis, you'd have to go back to early, mid-2020 to find this, this big of a move other than what we did in November of 2022-2021 uh, time period. Now, uh, are you seeing uh, any weather damage coming to this crop? Well, I think we still have hot spots in the United States crop. I mean, I was just looking at the 14-day precipitation totals in the primary corn belt and then looking at the 14-day precipitation versus normal in that same area. And I think the upper Midwest along the Iowa-Minnesota border, the top part of Illinois, the bottom part of Wisconsin, top part of Indiana and Ohio, still having issues issues that and and going west you know could say that eastern nebraska southern excuse me southeastern parts of of uh, of uh, uh, north dakota and and northwestern northeastern parts of south dakota these areas are still hot spots parts of missouri are as well and there's and there's a little bit in east central illinois as well i think you still have hot spots but i think the trade feels like the corn crop is made at this point and with more rain expected in some of those areas uh, that the trade is not as nervous. I think what we're seeing in the post report environment in the in the row crops is is pretty much fun driven. Um, they're going after the beans that the corn is following because the bean corn ratio is so extended at this point, especially new crops. So if beans go higher, I think the corn by default almost has to keep track or keep up with it. I wonder if that's not just due to the currencies, but also due to more and more concerns about El Nino. Global weather, I think, maybe is starting to take hold here. I just found out from a Bloomberg news article on 
uh, Thursday morning that we're looking at the possibility of India now halting their exports of rice. So we already have an a, a export ban essentially um, of wheat in that country. Now they're looking at maybe doing anything, all rice except for non-basmati rice. So I think we are getting more of an El Nino feel in this market and, and the macro market is giving us a strong tailwind with this uh, CPI data pushing that dollar down so aggressively. Yes, and another global uh, thing uh, in context, uh, and I mentioned that before, but now we have more data. Basically, all kinds of meat the Brazil is exports to China uh, had less demand over the last quarter. And uh, many of the Wall Street financial institutions uh, have uh, reduced uh, their prospects for growth in China, but it seems uh, way, way, uh, still uh, way above what uh, the partial numbers are showing. Uh, some uh, institutions have reduced their second quarter growth from 5 to 1%, and, and some are even coming with less than that, and uh, they are still not changing their prospects for the whole year. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a real troubling issue right now because why they're doing that, I think, Luis, is because they think that China is going to stimulate their economy like they have in the past. I don't see that as likely this time around because of the debt load that China is carrying. And let's be honest, every time they stimulate their economy, it goes straight into their property and real estate market. It drains the savings of the Chinese uh, individuals and, and, and the people of China, which still have a very large savings rate. Um, they're trying to get the Chinese to consume more, pull money out of their savings. But if the Chinese do that, they usually go into the property and real estate. And that's where the biggest bubble is right now. And that's where the Chinese government knows that. And so they're really hamstrung in terms of what kind of policy move they can make at this point, unless they go more direct policy incentives that would stimulate some other type of non-real estate type um, uh, uh, of, uh, of demand and consumption. But that then tends to be negative commodities. And I think it's really important to notice that the world, and I'm going to try and tie this back into the grain, so help me if it doesn't make sense, but the world wheat stocks to use ratios dropped dramatically in USDA's report from 34% in the June report down to 333 that was due to a production cut globally and a total usage increase of about 6.8 million tons. That was a big change. And, and it's very odd to see those go in opposite direction where you see a production cut and a demand increase. And so I think the reason that the wheat market is not playing ball with the row crops and the rally in this El Nino mindset goes directly back to what you're talking about with China, because we see copper and we see crude oil and we see soft red wheat oftentimes trade very similar trends and they move up and down very closely with one another very frequently at times. And so when I see the copper, the soft red wheat and the crude oil not doing much, even though OPEX cut their supply, even though USDA just cut their supply on wheat, I think it really does hone right back into China and the market not really willing to give the wheat a fair shake, especially with harvest still going on, and especially with really good yields in soft red wheat country. We don't know what the hard red wheat yields are because Kansas is so behind. Now, considering a good corn and soybean harvest in the U.S., a good safrinha crop in Brazil, and a further slowdown in China or maybe a recession in China, what will be your marketing strategy recommended to corn and soybean growers? Yeah, great question. I just did a webinar for the clients last weekend, and I hit this, you know, did about 30 slides, about 50 minutes long. And the end result was this. We are still in a weather and supply driven market until the dollar breaks and until we bring back demand. I think demand is coming back, but I think we're going to have to wait until the end of the calendar year of 2023 before we get that demand back. So unless the dollar moves down and the Federal Reserve at the end of the month supports this idea that the dollar needs to move down, um, I think we're still in a weather supply driven market and we wanna hedge into rallies. And that means the soybeans, that's where the soybean 
options. We still have a 120 ending stocks number in the world. Um, you know, you talked about the, the the supply of South American beans. We're pretty assured of the supply of beans. Conab just came out this morning and gave their corn number of 127. That makes a lot of sense to me. I can't get above 130 on total corn because of some of these key areas that have had weather issues. And so my basic point being, we've got ample supplies out there until we get the dollar down and we get the export demand back as we see livestock numbers shrink here domestically. Yes, we've got some uh, jet fuel business to come down the road, but for right now, sell rallies because it's weather and it's supply driven rallies and wait for that demand turnaround. Now, what are you seeing uh, as a strategy for the livestock uh, producers? Because uh, they, they seem to have a tough time in the United States. Yeah, they do, but they have really good prices in the back end markets. And that's where the December, the February fat cattle, the November, the January feeder cattle markets are very elevated. They're well above where we were back in 2014, 2015. USDA is projecting a, a 2024 beef production number that is well above where we were back in 2015. And yet we're about, as of Thursday morning, things opening about $15 above the high from 2014, 2015 in the December contract. So I'm still recommending hedging those deferred markets, Louise, and essentially taking the risk in the cash market for what you're dealing with in marketing right now. All right, Mike, that's it for now. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Louise. Nice to talk to you.